Mr. Paul Markovich, who is president and CEO of Blue Shield of California. Uh, Paul has a BA in International Political Economy from Colorado College. My degree is just political science, so I'm really impressed with that. Uh, and a Rhodes, he is a Rhodes Scholar from Oxford University, where he earned his master's degree in philosophy, politics, and economics. Uh, Paul started his professional career as a management consultant with Booz Allen Hamilton in New York City. And he joined Blue Shield originally in the late 1990s, where he led the company's product development unit for five years. Along, uh, along that way, some of his notable innovations that he helped uh, create at Blue Shield were the first California HMO to allow self-referrals to specialists, and Blue Shield's first website. Uh, believe it or not, it's not that long ago we didn't have websites, and uh, so Paul was a key part of Blue Shield developing their first website. Uh, took a, he took a two and a half year stint away from Blue Shield starting in 2000 and co-founded My Way Health, a consumer-driven health plan, and then he joined Definity Health in 2001. Uh, in 2002, he came back to Blue Shield as Senior Vice President of the CalPERS Business Unit those of us who work for the university know CalPERS very well, so thank you, Paul. Uh, other Blue Shield leadership roles include the large group business unit in 2004, and then in 2009, he took over as chief operating officer for Blue Shield in charge of multiple units. He developed and launched California's first network-based provider partnership, and he became Blue Shield's president and CEO on January 1, 2013, so he has an anniversary coming up in about a month. Uh, in 2015, he led Blue Shield's acquisition of Care First Medical Health Plan, marking the company's entry into the Medi-Cal program. And he currently serves on the board of directors of America's Health Insurance Plans and the California Association of Health Plans. Please join me today in welcoming Mr. Paul Markovich, President and CEO, Blue Shield. Well, good afternoon, everybody. I think we're a few minutes into the afternoon. Thanks for coming, uh, especially over the lunch hour. I mean, aren't, aren't uh, students at a campus like this usually hungry right around now? Yeah. <clears throat> I was just at a, a conference the other day, and I, I was trying to do the, I'll show you the demo later. I was doing the demo with somebody, and uh, they were a little disappointed with how the results turned out, and they said they're going to have to go see their doctor, and it reminded me of a joke that I shared with them and I share with you now. And when, when a patient walks into a doctor's office and says, doctor, I'd like to live forever. Um, how can I do that? And the doctor pauses and looks at him and says, uh, well, if you uh, don't eat any fatty foods um, and uh, you stop smoking, no alcohol, no drugs, you remain celibate, just going through pretty much every vice imaginable and saying, if you just don't do this and you don't do this, and, he, and as he's Describing this, the patient gets, starts to get excited. He says, Doctor, are you, you telling me if I do all these things that I'm going to live forever? And the doctor said, oh, no, you're going to die, but it'll feel like you're living forever. <laughs> so uh, I, I, uh, I, I love that joke because the number of people who are... It's, there's a, a friend of mine who, who uh, was born in Scotland, moved to Canada, and then ultimately migrated to California, and he said... You know, that's the, di the difference between Californians, the Scots, the Canadians, and the Californians can be summed up with their attitude towards death. Um, because the Scots see it as imminent, the Canadians see it as inevitable, and the Californians see it as optional, right? So, <clears throat> uh, I, what I wanted to talk to you about today is how technology can help us create a healthcare system that's worthy of our family and friends, and sustainably affordable, and what we're trying to do to make that happen. Uh, there's a whole lot of other things that we need to do to create that system that I described, but my focus today, I really want to be on how technology can do it, how bringing healthcare into the digital age is crucial, and perhaps the most crucial foundational aspect of creating a system that's transformed from the one that we experience today. Um, first, let me talk a little bit about uh, Blue Shield and who we are. Uh, we're about to go into our 78th year of existence. We were formed as a not-for-profit uh, not by physicians. Uh, we were one of the first uh, statewide health plans that was sponsored by physicians. Um, we have a little over 4 million members today. That means people who actually have 
uh, some type of insurance from Blue Shield of California. Uh, we'll have about $17 billion of revenue in 2016, 6,000 employees. And uh, we, as a nonprofit, cap our income, uh, which means that we've, we've taken what we call a 2% pledge, which means if our net income as a percentage of revenue exceeds 2% in any given year, we give back the excess of that back to our customers or the community. <clears throat> and that's one of the ways that we try to kind of live up to our not-for-profit uh, moniker. We also give substantial sums of money to our foundation. So if you think about a 2% pledge at $17 billion, that's $340 million. We, on average, give about 10% of that away to a, a charity in, in the form of our foundation that gives to um, the prevention of domestic violence and gives to safety net providers those that are serving those in need, in, in most need, particularly Medi-Cal beneficiaries or those who don't have insurance whatsoever. Uh, so that's a little bit about Blue Shield and, and who we are. Um, we have a mission. You know, as a for-profit organization, there tends to be a focus on um, earnings per share or shareholder return. As a nonprofit, our guiding star is our mission, which is to ensure all Californians have access to high-quality health care and affordable price. What that means to me and to us is that we're here to create a healthcare system that's worthy of our family and friends and sustainably affordable. And I like that expression because it's a gut check. Like when we sit down and talk about it, at, about six months ago, I was sitting down with our chief medical officer who said, was working on what we call our oncology practice of the future, trying to figure out what the treatment of cancer should look like um, in the future. And, he laid it out for me and he said, I, does this hit the mark? And I said, I don't know. Is that care that's worthy of your family and friends and sustainably affordable? We can all understand that. If you haven't already used the healthcare system, at some point in your life you will. I can guarantee you that someone you love, someone you know has already used the healthcare system. Right? I'm guessing most of you were born in a hospital somewhere. Right? Not in a barn, not at home. <clears throat> uh, so, the, the question really becomes, how should the system work when, God forbid, someone you love, someone you care about deeply, has a, a health issue, a serious health issue, at their time of greatest need, at their time of greatest stress, how are they getting treated? And that's the ultimate litmus test to me as to whether the system's working. And first and foremost, you've got to be able to afford it. Right? Otherwise, you're not going to have insurance and you can't access the system at all. So it's not just about quality. It's also about affordability. But that, to me, is the ultimate test, and, and it gives us something to really do a gut check on everything that we're doing. But we're doing more than a gut check. Um, in all of my the economics part of my training, I, I'm looking for quantifiable goals. Um, and here's the first one. We've... Uh, We've developed these partnerships with providers that we are referred to as accountable care organizations or by their acronym ACOs. I won't go into a detailed description of them at this point. We started our first one. We signed an agreement in 2009. We launched it in 2010. We now have close to 40 of these across most parts of the most populous parts of California. And what we've experienced is that the healthcare cost trend, the increase in healthcare costs each year have averaged annually 2.8% in these partnerships versus 7% on average for everything else. And that 7% is pretty typical of what's happened in the industry. If you think about how much health insurance premiums increase each year, it's generally been on average by about that much over the past decade. Uh, so we, uh, we put these partnerships together. We're very excited about them. And one of the things we realized from that is one of the ways that we made this happen is we sat down with these partners and said, um, came up with projects, usually a dozen or so, 12 to 15 projects. One example would be, how do we reduce the inpatient readmission rate? So if you've been in the hospital and then you've been discharged from the hospital, how frequently, what percentage of the time, within 30 days, do you get readmitted to the hospital? And what I've said to folks is this is both a cost and quality issue because I've yet to meet anybody who really wants to go back to the hospital like, you know, love the gowns and the food was great, you know, can't wait to get back to the hospital. So it's a, it's a cost and a quality issue. 
Um, so we've sat down, we've worked this out, we've done a re-engineered the process. We've dropped on average the inpatient readmission rate by 15 to 20 percent in these ACOs. It's one of the reasons the costs have come down. And how do I know this? Because we have taken Excel spreadsheets from the physicians, and Excel spreadsheets from the hospital, and Excel spreadsheets from Blue Shield of California, and six months after the fact, after all this has actually happened, we've had lawyers looking over people's shoulders while well, they crammed together circa 1980 technology, Excel spreadsheets, to get the data in a, in a format that we can actually understand what the re inpatient readmission rate has been. Uh, which is one of the reasons why I've come to the conclusion there must be a better way than that to, uh, to bring data together and bring healthcare into the digital age. So we're very excited about this, but the only way to truly make these partnerships create that system that I talked about is if we can bring healthcare into the digital age. In the meantime, we've got more work to do on our goals. I talked about affordability right, and quality as key parts of our mission. And, uh, and we've, we've done some quantification on what these goals are. So the first one we come up with is what we call total cost of ownership on the affordability side. What we mean by that is the premium that we collect plus any out-of-pocket payments that you make, copay, deductible, coinsurance, right? Uh, so just the all-in cost of healthcare. What is that for a typical family of four in California divided by the median income of that family of four in California? And what we found is that our most popular product costs uh, somewhere in the neighborhood just north of $16,000 a year all in for a family of four in California. And their median income is between sixty and sixty-five thousand dollars. Okay, so if they were paying for this, this is not take-home pay. This is not after-tax pay. This is gross income, median income for that family. Which means that our most popular product, it would take twenty-six percent of your gross income to pay for it today. And every year, health insurance premiums go increase at a higher rate than the roughly two percent wage increase that people average. This gets worse. And what we've said is, we believe that we need to be less than 20%. Right now, our ACOs, on average, are around 18 and a half. So what we're trying to do is keep it below 20, and then if we can get this down to 2% or lower and keep it there, then we've got something that's truly affordable, right? So that's the goal. And then on clinical quality and customer quality, we've come up with, there's over 50 measures that we've come up with. Uh, I won't go into the details of these things. There are things like, did you have your vaccinations? Um, if you're a diabetic, are your blood sugar levels being monitored within certain ranges? Uh, things that are uh, data that's collected typically nationally, there's benchmarks for them. And what we've said is that benchmarking against the national standard, we need to be in the 90th percentile. If we're in the 90th percentile, it counts. If we're less than the 90th percentile, it doesn't count. So we need 100% of those measures to be in the 90th percentile. That's what we're defining as care that's worthy of our family and friends and sustainably affordable. We're at 45% now. We're not in the 45th percentile. 45% of these measures were in the 90th percentile. Okay? And then we've got a similar matric, uh, metric here for customer quality. So we've tried to quantify this, uh, what I think is this very worthy aim. So what I want to shift gears and talk about is the importance of bringing healthcare into the digital age, of leveraging technology to create this future that I just talked about. Um, now, it may be a little surprising because there's tremendous science and technology that's being you know, discovered, used, leveraged in healthcare. If you think about all the testing that's done between MRIs and CT scans and high imaging devices, um, think about breakthrough drugs, uh, Gilead came out with Savaldi and Herboni, which basically cure hepatitis C at an unduly high expense, but that's another story from my vantage point. Um, there's uh, robotic surgeries that are happening right now, miniature robots being used to help aid surgery, sometimes complete surgeries. Uh, there's a whole series of truly amazing technology that's been using in healthcare. And yet, because the information, the basic information about a patient is highly fragmented. 
um, and, and difficult, and, and the systems that we have in healthcare are not interoperable. Basic service to the member and basic clinical decision making, diagnosis, um, figuring out what care treatment path to take and adhering to that treatment. I use more technology to figure out how to drive from San Jose to Oakland, right, using Google Maps or Waze, than, than a, a physician would use to diagnose me with prostate cancer. Okay, I, I go through the same experience Almost every year, I go check in with my primary care physician, and within 24 hours, I use my phone to do a banking transaction. I use my phone to order a car. I use my phone to pay for parking. I walk into my doctor's office. My doctor uses an electronic medical record assiduously. I walk into my doctor's office. I get handled, handed a clipboard right, where I can write out my name, my address, whether I'm taking any medicines, whether I'm allergic to anything. Kind of important information, wouldn't you say, like allergies? And we're using centuries-old technology to write this down on a piece of paper still. Um, another example, I sat on the, uh, a panel earlier this year with the CEO of Genomic Health, Kim Popovitz. Uh, Genomic Health came up with a test for women that have breast cancer. And that test, with most women that have breast cancer, a certain profile, it, it predicts whether chemotherapy will be effective or not. It's highly determinative in terms of whether chemotherapy will be an effective treatment for that woman given her genetic profile. The test was approved by the FDA in 2004, 12 years old. It's been written into over 90% of the care protocols nationwide for oncologists. And by the way, why wouldn't you want this test administered? If it was your sister, your mother, if it were you, I mean, wouldn't you want to know? Like, why would you want to be injecting toxic poisons into your system and going through hell I mean, if you know anyone who's gone through chemotherapy, this is not fun, okay? If you knew it wasn't going to work in advance, right? So the very definition of quality health care, this should be happening. They went back and said, what percentage of the time is this actually happening? What percentage of the time is this test being conducted before chemotherapy is administered in California? 32%. And she said to me, why are you paying for this? Why are you paying for chemotherapy when this test hasn't been done? Great question, right? Well, here's the problem. Today, I receive the claim for that care typically six to eight weeks after it happens. So I don't even know what's happened until the claim comes in. The other alternative that I have in the way the system set up today is to do this thing called prior authorization, right? which everybody loves. Bureaucrats like me get to go tell physicians, you need to get permission to go take, do this treatment in advance. You need to show and demonstrate to me that you've done this test before you take on this treatment, which you know, everybody loves. I'm sure everybody would believe that the health plan was trying to do quality care as opposed to um, you know, penny pinching and trying to prevent a woman from getting a life-saving treatment, right? Because everybody trusts their health plan. Why wouldn't they think that? So those are two examples of you know, the cares out there. The ability, and yet, despite all this technology, despite where we live, we're not leveraging it and using it in a way to create a patient experience that we should have and creating a healthcare system that's worthy of our family and friends and sustainably affordable in case of the oncology example. So we need to do better, and we're trying to. So here's what we're up to. Um, <clears throat> Right now, there's no way to put together what I call a longitudinal patient record, a comprehensive, real-time, secure, digital record of every piece of information, health information about you in one place that can be accessed and used on an open platform with APIs such that the same way you can build an app on an iPhone or an Android, you can build an app, a health app, on top of this. We, we don't have that in healthcare. But through this California Integrated Data Exchange, we're trying to create it. And what it's doing is taking information from the electronic medical record of physicians, the electronic medical record from hospitals, lab information, pharmacy information, all the information that comes from the health plan's claim, and put it all together, integrate it, 
and create a comprehensive record for every single California on an open platform with APIs, such that now there's some wonderful tools out there, I'm about to show you one, that you can connect very quickly and easily at scale across all the providers in California and have them access it, or as a, any consumer in California who wants to access their information. You can build applications, and then, of course, you can make it a much more friendly and better user interface. This would completely transform the kind of experiences I just talked about. My walking into the doctor's office and get a clipboard would go away. Uh, being able to tie payment uh, in advance, having everybody know in advance that they need this test. If you happen to have breast cancer before you uh, do chemotherapy, that's something that would be known real time. Okay. That's what we're trying to build right now, and we're a little over two years into it. Let me give a sense of where we are. Um, we created the California Integrated Data Exchange jointly with our, one of our largest competitors. Uh, California is a little unique. Uh, there's, most states have a Blue Cross Blue Shield plan. Um, California is one of, I think, three states where there's a separate Blue Cross plan and a Blue Shield plan, and they actually compete with one another. So I, I run nonprofit Blue Shield of California. Separately, there's an Anthem Blue Cross of California, which is a part of for-profit, publicly traded Anthem. Together, we put in $80 million to create a separate nonprofit entity, the California Integrated Data Exchange. We put in all our patient records associated with it, around 10 million in total. <clears throat> we have more, this is five providers, but uh, two of the providers are very large hospital systems. So right now, there's probably around you know, 40 hospitals and close to 5,000 physicians that have signed up for this, which is about close to 10% of our network of providers with whom we, we contract. Uh, and, uh, and we've completed a prototype. We've actually completed this record that I just talked about. Comprehensive record where we merged all this data onto the, onto the platform. There's a ton of more work to do. This is still what I call an entrepreneurial effort. Uh, there's plenty of things that we can have messed up along the way, and we'll probably mess it up some more. But it's got a, a lot of promise, and it's at the center, I think, of um, this transformation that we're trying to create in our healthcare system. So let me give you an example of something that, uh, oh, I'm going to come back. I want to give an example of what's possible uh, if this system, if we can uh, uh, complete it the way I've envisioned it and described it to you. Because I, I go around all the time, given where we are located, we're headquartered in San Francisco, all the time I'm talking to these amazing entrepreneurs, early stage companies, they've got all these ideas about how they can affect and impact healthcare or the service that somebody has, an application, a software, uh, and, and they'll show up and they'll say, here it is, and I'm like, wow, that's amazing. And so how could we go do this? And the problem that they have is that these electronic medical records are, are created in these kind of islands. So the, the big electronic medical record providers, Epic, Cerner, et cetera, they generally do custom implementations for every single uh, physician group or hospital that, with whom they work, which means that they organize the data slightly differently in every circumstance. And so you can't just pull the rows and columns together and easily aggregate data from one provider to another provider, even if they're using the same vendor for an electronic medical record. Uh, and, and so the, the challenge they run into is, well, if I want to use this application, I need the underlying data. To get the underlying data, I need to build this into the electronic medical record or at least be able to be compatible with it. And in order to do that, I have to go to one physician group, build it out, and then I built it out there. Then I go to the next one, and I build it out. And then I go to the next one. You get in the sense that this is not a scalable solution, right? And if you haven't heard, there's this thing called the cloud, right? Where if you can create a different kind of platform and make it open, you can create a much more scalable solution. So there's a lot of entrepreneurs out there with great ideas, with great products, um, that are frustrated by the fact that they can't really scale them and get to adoption quickly. And I'm going to show you one uh, right now by way of example. Hopefully everybody here has a healthy heart, but not everybody does. 
people will have uh, problems here and there. So what I'm about to show you is an application where in 30 seconds, I'm going to do an FDA-approved medical-grade EKG. EKG is a measurement of my heart. It will actually take my... Uh, you've, you've seen heart rates, right, it, uh, or an EKG. It kind of goes up and comes down. It spikes up and comes down when your heart's beating. And it'll show the pattern of your heartbeat. And it'll show your beats per minute. And then when it gets done, like it did yesterday successfully, it'll, it'll show, it'll diagnose. It'll say, is there a problem? Or do you basically have no anomalies? And it actually ties to the physician record. So you could do this. You can imagine with someone who has heart problems, you're at home. You don't have to come into the physician office. You don't have to get hooked up to a really, uh, a, an actual EKG machine. You can just do this from home. You can instantaneously wire this to your, uh, or communicate this to your physician. Um, there's a basic uh, technology and an algorithm that will identify whether there's a real problem that needs to be addressed or whether things look fine. Um, this is something that has got a lot of potential to help treat and monitor people with uh, heart failure. And it's the exact sort of thing. I was sitting down with the chief operating officer of this company, and he was explaining to me the challenge in getting this scaled up. And it's the kind of thing that when you create something like a Cal Index, um, you can really bring healthcare into the future, into the technology age. You can start using, you can get all the way to the point where you start using, you can imagine artificial intelligence to help with decision making, to help with um, uh, the care and treatment and the adherence to treatment for individuals. There's um, a number of breakthroughs that are coming through where whether it's in a medicine or in a small device that's in, or an implant, um, there's the ability to track basic biometric information, important health information, and then wirelessly communicate that information back. But to get all this data and make sense of it, right, then you want to be able to use technology. But the basic thing that you need and I'm gonna, this is how I'm going to close this out. But the basic thing that you need is you need the data. You need a comprehensive digital record. It needs to be on an open platform. I liken it to getting electricity to the home in a standard voltage. Right? It's wonderful to get a high-definition television set, a smart refrigerator, a whole series of electronic devices. But if you can't get electricity to the home in a standard voltage, none of that works. And that's where we are in healthcare right now. But with that, I really wanted to make sure we had time for questions and dialogue, um, and I can stop preaching at you now and see what's on your mind. So thank you. It's okay. Don't worry. We're, we're good. We're good. Hi. Yes. Yes, sir. With all this data that's been electrically yeah. Online, uh, as well as increasing risks of confidentiality and the chance of getting hacked. Yes. And then saying, how, what are you doing to, to cover that corner? Y yeah. You might imagine we spent a lot of time on this. Uh, within six months of launching the California Integrated Data Exchange, Anthem Blue Cross, not CalIndex, but Anthem Blue Cross, the company, got hacked. Uh, there was a data breach. And it turns out, um, it was published in the Washington Post, that uh, it was Chinese-sponsored government hackers that um, breached them. So these are very sophisticated, very persistent folks. And I can tell you that, that because they're also trying to get into our systems as well. So we spent a lot of time figuring out with whom are we going to work, because we're using a, a, a vendor called Orion that's based in New Zealand. And what is their security setup? Not just their technical security. Um, you know, we talk about defense and layers, right? And then, uh, and also the physical security, right? Because it's amazing how much people will just literally pick up somebody's ID and then that's how they get in. It's not by penetrating the system directly. So I won't go into the details of it because I've been sworn not to. But basically, you know, you can imagine some things. For example, defense and layers. Uh, and, and, and picking out anomalies and having limits. So if you're a physician, an authorized physician in the system, generally speaking, you're only going to see maybe a couple dozen patients in a day. There's no need for you to be downloading 100 records or 1,000 records or a million records. 
and there's no reason for you to have permission in the system to do that. So as you know, defense and layers, the idea is if somebody's persistent enough and they're at it, whether it's through spear phishing or something else, they're going to find a way to get in. The question is, can you figure that out quickly, shut it down, and limit any access and damage to a small level? Uh, prevent that from happening as much as possible, but when it does happen, because inevitably it will, uh, is that it's really minor, not even reportable kind of thing. And so I'm, I guess what I'd say is I'm not an expert at this, but I spent hours with these folks to understand it because that is by far the biggest concern that I have. You know, you think about your family. I don't, I don't really feel like be having their information broadcast to the world or sold online. So, yeah. You would? Okay. Well, the, what's happening here is I'm trying to use this... Uh, I'll plug it in. It's the. I can get it up. That's not the problem. What I'm trying to do is actually um, do this EKG device. So I said record now. I think it's just a problem with this. See how it's continuously initializing. Have you tried I like a device to or something before? Get it to work. So anyway, I just don't think it's worth it at this point. So <laughs> every time I fail at it, I feel like, gosh, you know, this is getting worse and worse by the minute. So um, oh, yeah, so it happens. Yes, sir, I think there's a microphone. Um, Do you mind? Uh, oh. You project well, but if you don't mind. Sure. Um, sorry, I've lost my words. Oh, uh, I worked at a doctor's office for many years, and the doctors were fine with trying to use new tools like uh, electric um, medical records, right? The owner and the managers, not so much on board. Um, how are you encouraging them to get on with this? System? Yes. Well, the way that we set this up is um, we've tried to learn from, there's been plenty of failures in the past. There's been many, many attempts to create this kind of uh, health information exchange, is what they're called. Uh, most of them have failed, and we've tried to learn from that. So the number one thing is to uh, create value. In other words, it's, there's a positive value proposition here, which means it doesn't cost you anything, right? It's free, and if you sign up, you get access to data that you're currently not getting access to. So most physicians, for example, don't have access to, they, they might have written the prescription, and they may know whether they've written a prescription. They have no idea if that prescription's been filled. Uh, and they don't know if, if they're taking drugs from some other doctor has per, done a prescription, and they don't have any site, uh, any line of sight as to what that is. So the pharmacy information is really be beneficial and useful. It's already in Calindex. So the moment you sign up, A, it doesn't cost you anything, and B, you can access this data for the uh, patients that you have permission to access it, not anybody. Uh, so in effect, there's a value proposition, right? There's value in this. Um, there's also, uh, when we get to the momentum, we're not there yet, but when we get to enough of the big players signing up, there's also this sense of, I'm going to get left behind if I don't join, right? So, it's, uh, it's that tipping point that you're all familiar with. You know, why is everybody on Facebook? Because everyone's on Facebook. If you want to find someone, you know, socially, that's where you'd find them. Uh, and similarly here, you know, if we can get all the providers online, then, wow, there's all this data that's available. And if a patient, by the way, moves from one physician group to another physician group, you're, you're entitled to a three-year history. So when they show up, it's not like they were just born and you're trying to figure out what health conditions they might have you get a three-year history of them. So those are, those are things that are directly beneficial to the physician, to the physician's office, um, at, at hopefully the price is right, at zero, and, uh, and that's the, the pitch we're basically giving. Yes, sir, boy, the front row is active. You guys in the back have gotta pick it up. Hi, um, so in your opinion, why do you, why do you think that uh, the medical medical field has taken so long in improving um, technology and yeah. and on sorts? Well, it's a, it's a highly fragmented, highly fragmented industry. There's a number of uh, parts of it that are still very much cottage industry-like. You know, there's not really big players. There's not a small number of, uh, of big players. 
Um, we never set a standard at the, at the federal level. So if you think about, we didn't have the equivalent of the internet, right, where there was kind of a standard for how to do this that was established um, more voluntarily in that case. Uh, so when, when the federal government said, oh, we're going to um, subsidize what they call meaningful use, which is the adoption of electronic medical records, there was no standard set for how that data could be collected and organized. And so it was just organized in lots of different ways. Um, and we would have been far better off, whether it was at the government level or at the private sector level, to say, look, if we're going to get all these manila folders and pieces of paper and, and x-rays and get them into digital form, why don't we do it in a way that it's interoperable? Never did that. Uh, should have, clearly. Never did. And that's been the biggest barrier. Yes, sir. <laughs> Hi, um, I was just wondering, um, with, like you were talking about the federal government and gathering the information with the change of, um, well, the talk about getting rid of the ACA, I knew that had a lot of um, requirements for pushing forward for a digital uh, database for medical, right. and now that's probably going to be thrown away. So I was wondering how you guys are dealing with that transition going from the ACA to whatever's coming. Well, yeah, we, we're uh, at this point bracing for it, I'd say, because we don't know what it is. And we don't know when it's coming. I think we're all um, just speculating as to what it might be. We know change is coming. Um, I, I believe there's a lot of different ways to get to the outcome we're looking to get to. We're looking to get everyone access to high quality, affordable care. There are policy constructs, like what we were doing in the Affordable Care Act and we are doing today, but they don't have to look exactly like the Affordable Care Act in order to still give everyone access to high quality health care at an affordable price. Um, so, okay, if you don't want to do a mandate and you'd rather create an incentive to get people into the pool and participate, that could work if it's structured in the right way. So if, if, like, the Republicans are very averse to any kind of mandate, um, but if you, don't have, if you don't have a way to attract healthy people to buy health insurance, uh, then it, it doesn't sustain itself because people just wait until they get sick. It's a bit like getting homeowner's insurance and then waiting till you have a fire and then applying for homeowner's insurance. I mean, if you, if for health insurance, if you just wait around and say, wow, I just came back and I got diagnosed with, uh, with cancer. I guess I better go get health insurance. You can imagine how expensive it gets, uh, and, and it's not really affordable. So you have to have a way to attract healthy people, but does it have to be a mandate structured the way that the mandate was structured in the Affordable Care Act? No. There's other ways to strongly encourage and gain participation of a broad set of people, including those that are healthy in the health insurance pool. The question that I really have going into this is, whether what is proposed, in fact, does set up a policy framework where we are more likely to get people covered and, and provide high quality, affordable care. If large portions of these subsidies are just pulled, you saw how expensive it is, just even with the Blue Shield product, right? Over 16 grand for a family of four. If you start pulling subsidies and asking people making that amount of money to cover their family, they're having to choose between rent and food and everything else. It's, uh, it's not going to happen. There's a bunch of people who are going to drop off insurance. The Affordable Care Act has uh, expanded insurance coverage for over 20 million people. Um, and, uh, and a big part of that has been the subsidization of a very expensive product. And it, to the extent that gets dropped a great deal, then it will impact how many people have access and have coverage. And that's really probably the biggest question in what they come forward with is, whether it's in tax credits or whether there's a mandate isn't so as important as will there be financial support uh, and will there be an incentive structure to ensure that the, the pool of people who are covered is broad. So we'll see. Stay tuned. What else? Yes, sir. 
So my question is, uh, you were talking about pharmacies and connecting them with uh, doctors. Yeah. So there's like in-house hospital pharmacies and then pharmacies like Walgreens. Have you reached out to them because they are a for-profit? It may be like a little different. And uh, what was your experience yeah. with them? Well, the, the good news is we don't really have to. I mean, I, I'm, I talk to these folks, uh, certainly do. But we actually don't, uh, we have their data. In other words, we get all the data in order to pay the bill for Walgreens or for the hospital pharmacy for that matter. We have to know all the relevant information. What's the drug? What's the dosage? Right? Um, how much does it cost? Because that is what uh, we determine the price that we reimburse them at based on the type of drug, the dosage, et cetera. And so we know it all. We have it all. And it's already in there. Uh, there may be ways that they could part, you know, help make this better. In other words, the pharmacist, to the extent that it makes sense for the pharmacist as a clinician to be able to access some of this information, there could be opportunities there. And we have not yet explored that with them, but I think that's a really good idea. Yeah. I think the reason why I asked was because I had to go to the pharmacy the other day yeah. and get, uh, get like some antibiotics. And I had to provide all my information to them. Uh, and they just sent an email over to them. Oh, yeah. So it sounds like we do need to give them access to this. <coughs> yeah. Did you use a pen and paper? Or did you? Yeah, yeah. Uh, good. That's good. Well, yeah. High tech. Uh, no, good point. We do definitely need to address that. Um, great point. What else? Yes, we've got one here and one here. <coughs> Um, as, I don't know how, how much data you get after somebody gets treatment or medicine or something like that, but if you do get the data of how effective it was, are you using that to then pool all of this data and say which treatments were effective, which were not, and so on? Well, that's the opportunity. I mean, everyone talks about big data, right? Uh, we have, uh, if, we, if we can get the providers to participate, even just with these two health plans, 10 million patient records is a lot. If we get all the payers to participate, it's going to be um, over 35 million records. Uh, there's a whole lot that could be learned uh, using that information. So what we have set up is um, an independent review board to take in requests for academic research um, and that we've also allowed the health plans, like as a health plan, do the privacy laws, I can access all this information for all our four million members. But I can't access it for Anthem or somebody else. Uh, if I want to access it on what's called a de-identified basis, in other words, I, I can't identify or tie the information. I might know, might know, might know that it's a 61-year-old male living in Riverside County, but I can't know the name or the social security number of those people. That information is where this independent review board comes in. If you would like to study a really broad data set you know, for public health purposes and start to see causality, like what, what are the things that are, what treatments are working or not working? What percentage of the time are people doing this versus that? What were the outcomes in this case versus that case, which is the kind of thing I think you're talking about? That there's going to be an avenue for people much more skilled than I am, academics, to take this big data and analyze it, but it has to go through an independent review board to make sure it follows all the rules, that it's really meant for to improve public health, uh, that if you do the analysis, you must publish it and make it available publicly so everyone can benefit from it, et cetera. So there's a, a process set up for that. Any more questions? I think we had a... <clears throat> um, I had two questions, and that was one of them. But oh, okay. My other question is a bit more specific. Um, one, once in a while, I will I will go in for a medical checkup and fill out my reason for being there, I, any conditions, uh, my allergies, medications, and then I'll have the nurse ask me the same questions, and then later the doctor will ask me the same questions. Right. Is, is this something that would be addressable by, by this sort of system? I don't know why we'd want to address that, because it just seems like so much fun to repeat yourself. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm obviously being facetious, yes. Absolutely. This is exactly the sort of thing. It's also the sort of thing where 
if you wanted to confirm it, you should be, you should be able to confirm it electronically. Uh, it's, it's understandable why folks check. They want to make sure there wasn't an error the time before. But I think all of us in the room could design a much more user-friendly process that um, is much uh, more, uh, less error-prone than I write it down, then I get asked, then I get asked again. So this is absolutely the sort of thing, if we can gather that information in one place, absolutely the sort of thing that would, uh, I think, take that out of the picture. Like you, would, you would have, you could confirm this online if each year they just need to make sure you're updated on any allergies or anything else. You could just do it. There should be an application to do it. You can do it electronically. It's in the record. They know that you just confirmed this on this date, right? And they have, if they were to go to court, for example, they have proof that, in fact, you confirmed this and they made their decisions, medical decisions, based on this. I absolutely think this could take a lot of that out of the picture. Um, I know we're all going to be longing for those days of the pen and the pencil and the repeated interview, but I think we can, I think we can fix that. Yes, right down here. Um, I work at a provider's office, and uh, we deal with every every single type of insurance: Blue Cross, Blue Shield, United Healthcare. Um, but the one insurance that we've been having issues uh, is with Blue Shield. Okay. Uh, we've been experiencing major uh, claim delays processing. Um, what we've been told by the representatives of Blue Shield is that you guys underwent a platform update right, on right. 2015. So up until now, we have claims from January 2016 being on hold. What are you guys doing to address that, yeah. or to improve the processing time on those claims? Yeah, no, it's a great, great question. Um, so just to give you a sense of, I became CEO just under four years ago. And um, when I was chief operating officer, the technology team did not report to me. So the first time technology reported to me was um, when I became CEO just under four years ago. And I hired a chief information officer who came to me and said, uh, let me explain to you what we have. Because I told him, like, hey, we want to create this vision and we want to transform healthcare. And um, we have a claim system that was written in COBOL. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So everything up until the this move to a new system was written in COBOL. And if you can imagine all the jury rigging that had to go around that system to try to pull something out, I'll give you an example. The, uh, what we call a, the benefit. So is it a $20 copay for the physician and a $50 emergency room? And is there a deductible and how much is it? So for our old system, it was literally a string of code. We'd call it a benefit string. We had like four people in a room, you, you know the matrix? It's like they were like looking at screens and saying, oh, yeah, that's a $20 copay. You know, that's a $50 copay. I mean, this is literally a string of code. So when you needed to change a benefit, you'd have to go into the code and change the code in order to change the copay. There's no tables. It wasn't table driven, right? And then people would want to know, well, can you post on the Internet what my benefits are? Well, we had people translate strings of code and try to put them into the website. <clears throat> You know, know how many errors we had for people that would look up and say, but you told me my benefit was X. Oh, yeah, we got that wrong. Sorry about that. Or testing the accuracy of benefits. I can go on and on and on about this stuff. Um, so we said, oh, my God. And uh, we, we had all kinds of other challenges. The entire IT stack, we've uh, replaced our data centers. Um, we've uh, replaced our telephony infrastructure, our portal infrastructure. And we've migrated every single member onto a new modern claims and eligibility platform. And not shockingly, it didn't go perfectly. Right? And so what we've had is some pain, painful transition points. Um, but we should have that all cleaned up, I would say, if not by the end of this year, then certainly by the end of January. And if you haven't gotten current by then, call me yourself, and we'll make you current by then, OK? Um, so I appreciate the fact that this caused some pain. But hopefully, you, can, you understand the technology well enough to say, we couldn't stay on that platform. We couldn't possibly make this come true unless Blue Shield modernized itself in addition to trying to create this uh, healthcare system of the future via Cal Index. So um, we've been spending a lot of money and a lot of time doing that. And I'm, I'm sorry there's been some transitional pain, but it's going to be worth it.
Oh, nobody wants it. the responsibility of that one last question, right? It's all on you to really close it out. No. All right, thank you.